When we look at the body of work of any artist, we have a window into his soul. We can see his values and beliefs about life. What one believes is always reflected in one's creative work. The fundamental question then for the artist, as well as anyone else, is not, how do I express myself, but rather, what do I believe that has meaning? This is a program about an artist and his art. While many people dream of making a living by creating art, few actually succeed. There are artists who will make whatever sells, and artists who feel they have failed if people want to buy their work. Why does art move us emotionally, and yet often confuse us intellectually? Why is art treated with reverence formerly reserved for religion, whether it is understood or not? What makes a work of art significant or superficial? What are the differences and similarities between fine art and illustration? Our subject is the artist John Collier. Marshall Arisman of the School of Visual Arts in New York has called him one of five of this country's most important illustrators. I think that truth in a painting is irresistible, if not immediately, at least inevitably irresistible. Truth is inevitably irresistible, but lies can be very appealing for a while, especially beautiful lies. People keep coming back to the truth, but lies are soon forgotten. And that becomes one of the principal problems for the artist, learning to tell the difference between the truth and beautiful lies. A Japanese critic describes his work. If there are such people as born artists, then John Collier fits the description. His blurred lines, toned down colors, and low key subjects drawn on an enlarged scale give an impression of extreme depth of field. His illustrations seem to have stepped out of a classical mold and yet are actually very contemporary and youthful. What makes good art and bad art is really something that should be left to art historians. Um, I, have, uh, I think I have a pretty good idea of what makes art good. Um, and what makes art good can be for a lot of different reasons. Is it appropriate to the, whether it's appropriate to the assignment can make art work good, even if it's not lasting. People think, tend to think that I'm very tolerant of all types of art. And in one sense I am, but one reason I am is because I'm so, I'm so critical of, of most things that I tend to, this sounds conceited, but I really think that I have a very high standard for what, for what makes art good. And since almost, since very, very, very few pieces come up to that, especially my own, um, I tend to say, well, if it's not great art, then it's been all accepted for what it is. And so consequently, I accept probably a lot of things that I, that other people would, would not like. John Collier is the recipient of seven gold medals and nine silver medals from the Society of Illustrators in New York. His work has appeared in galleries and museums in major American cities, as well as in Paris, Tokyo, and London. From his work on the cover of Time magazine to his lectures at the Smithsonian, art academies, and universities, John has had a significant influence in the field of art. Special recognition is due to the corporations and individuals who have commissioned the artwork you are seeing in this program. Atlantic Records, H.J. Hines, Discipleship Journal, Time Life Books, Oscar de la Renta, Japan Barman's Association, Columbia Records, Masterpiece Theater, Push Pin Studios, Ladies Home Journal, Mother Jones, Red Book Magazine, Ritz-Carlton Hotel, 
Rita Marshall, Bob Dylan, Dallas Times Herald, Hallmark Corporation, Journal of Postgraduate Medicine, Minneapolis Zoological Society, McCall's Magazine, AMC Theaters, Etienne Delassert, Mobile Oil Corporation, and Byron Price. Most artists make their living as illustrators or designers or photographers, art directors. And so when a person decides they want to be an artist, they usually, they go to school, they think they're going to sit in front of an easel and, and draw and paint. Um, but gradually they realize that there, there are many ways of being an artist. But they still probably want to sit in front of an easel and draw and paint. And, um, but gradually they begin to, they, they begin to look at other, other students and they realize that they're probably not as good at drawing as some of the other students are, so they decide to become a designer and if they, if they still like, if they still like um, working with images, they may become a photographer. A student sitting in a class looks around himself and, and sees how well s some of the other people can draw. They draw really well. They start feeling awfully insecure and um, they start looking around for alternatives. These may not be accurate s statistics, but I've heard that of all of the students that decide to be artists, probably only 3% actually wind up being an artist. Even though most people that become artists study in art schools or in universities, I didn't learn that way. I, I became an artist <coughs> by being an apprentice at an advertising agency. Actually, an ap apprentice is probably an archaic word. Um, I would watch the other illustrators that came in and see what they did, and I would do occasionally get to do drawings for some of the art directors and they would criticize them or say I did a good job. Um, I really felt, I really felt like I'd missed the boat. I th but it wound up being a very, a very good education for me. I enjoy working at home, like a lot of illustrators and artists. Um, I work here with my wife, Shirley. She does the books and, and really does, um, does so much around the house. She does everything practically but the art, and it really allows me to, to do, she, it's really her that allows me to do the artwork that I do. Um, I'm, I enjoy being here with my children because uh, in a way, I'm, I'm like a farmer. I, I'm always around the house, and my wife is here, and when my children come home from school, we're able to talk to them and see how the day went. It's really a very pleasant life. Until you can't pay the bills, then it's a rotten life. In some ways, his award-winning work for commercial clients is surprising. There isn't a lot of marketing sizzle in many of his projects. Collier paintings don't cheerlead, they brood. His portfolio is populated with surreal animals and humans grappling with two moods, the ethereal and the sinister. His images in rich pastels and creamy oils are rarely abstract, but their relation to reality depends on more than sight alone perceives. I do a variety of subjects. These pieces were done for a book of ghost stories.
John Collier, though virtually self-taught, has been a professor of art at the University of Kansas through a grant from the Hallmark Corporation. He has also taught at the Fashion Institute of Technology and the Pratt Institute in New York. As a teacher of art, his comments about recent art history and the condition of art education go a long way toward explaining why contemporary art is the way it is. Students have not always been educated in drawing the way they are now. In fact, just a few years ago, drawing was considered well, practically irrelevant. In the 19th century, two things happened that paralleled each other. The, the Impressionists, who were, we now think, the most important artists of the period, uh, were, were disliked by the public and by many critics. At the time the Impressionists were painting, students were taught in what was called the academic method. They would work in front of models, and they, there were many rules that they had to follow, and if they didn't, they were, called, they were called on the carpet. They worked from casts. Really what this did was it forced a student's mind to think in a new way. It, in a way, it, art was taught the way music was taught at the, um, at the same time. Um, or dance, for instance. In teaching dance, you force a, a body into positions that are really unnatural to it, but after a while they become natural to it, and, and that was the purpose of drawing from casts and that type of thing. It forced a person's mind to think in ways that it wasn't used to thinking, but after a while it was natural again. <coughs> um, the public be began to realize after the Impressionists, that um, they had disliked the most important artists of the period. And um, after the Impressionists came the Post-Impressionists. Uh, with the Post-Impressionists, drawing was important, but it was, it was, acad academic drawing was not important. Um, after the Post-Impressionists came the Expressionists, drawing became less important. At the same time, the public, realizing that they had disliked the best artists of the period, um, a, a feeling about art developed. The public realizing that even though they didn't understand the art of the Impressionists or the Expressionists, would accept art at almost for almost any reason. John Collier is known primarily for two things. He is personally responsible for the introduction of the medium of pastels in contemporary illustration. And he is known for his ability to evoke classic images and to use elements of the past in fresh ways. I started working in pastels for an artificial reason. Um, well, actually, one artificial reason, one good reason. Uh, the artificial reason was I, I was confusing style with, with technique. And I thought, well, if, if for, I want to look, I don't want to look like anyone else. And if for no other reason, I won't look like anyone else because I'm using a medium that no one else is using. It, at the time, um, pastels hadn't been used in illustration, well, for, for a long time. I, I really don't remember the last time it was used. So that was an artificial reason to, to start using them. Uh, the better reason was I was, a, I was better at drawing than I was at painting, and it was a way of doing a color piece without, uh, without having to use paint. It really wasn't, I tried to use oil paints for 12 years before I was able to, to turn out a piece that I was happy with. I still use pastels probably 70% of the time. Uh, one reason is because people see my work, that it, they see something they like and they, it, mm, they want to use it, something like that, so they'll have me do pastels. If I've, I'm given my choice, which is normally the case, it's probably about 
50-50 as to whether I'll do oil or pastel. I like oils actually for the reason that most people use acrylics. Uh, most people use acrylics because they dry fast. I like to use oils because they, because they dry slowly. Um, you can come back to the studio the next day and it hasn't dried and you can work wet into wet, which is, I think, a much, creates a much more beautiful surface to a painting than working wet over dry. Stephen Heller, art director for the New York Times Book Review, says, John Collier, who initiated the pastel renaissance, uses style to convey a message. But aesthetic concerns, which harken back to the Italian Renaissance as a reaction against the modernist veneer, are predominant. His pictures soothe. Some people see my work and think of it as period, a period piece. They think of it as being um, antique. But I, I really see my work as, as contemporary. I see my work as being built on the past and I use the past in the same way that postmodern architects may use the past, combining it in new ways, in fresh ways, uh, to say something new. Illustrating the original story of Sleeping Beauty was a challenge John welcomed. It gave him an opportunity to explore the medium of lithography and to explore the deeper, darker side of this familiar story. I was contacted by Rita Marshall and Etienne de la Cert to do a children's book. I was given several choices and decided to do Peralt's The Sleeping Beauty. I decided to use lithography because it was an old medium and seemed appropriate for the subject. Lithography is uh, doing a drawing on a slab of, a slab of limestone. Uh, the drawing is inked and sent through a press with a piece of paper and the image is transferred to the paper. I later watercolored the drawings. When I was a child I saw Disney's version of The Sleeping Beauty and liked it very much. But that was one of the most difficult things for me to get rid of those images because I felt that more could be done with the story than was done with the, with the animated film. After I've designed the compositions of the individual pieces I get models together. The models can be students, myself, my wife, any friend that will stand still. I, I take photographs of local buildings and assemble all of these pictures together uh, to work from. The original story by Peralt is different from the animated Disney version. Disney really stops in the middle of the story. I try to teach my students, it's always better to work from knowledge than from ignorance. Um, I, I try to give, I try to have an approach that there's a right way to solve the problem that you've been given, and there are many ways that are bad to solve the problem that you've been given. Now, after I've said that, I try to say that there are many ways to break the rules and do a wonderful piece of art. But before you can learn to do a wonderful piece of art by breaking the rules, you have to know what the rules are. That's, that's what was lacking in my education, knowing what the rules are. In fact, people haven't been taught the rules so long that uh, 
that the rules have been forgotten. In teaching art, John assigns work and then offers advice and criticism as his students begin to work. In this class, they are each illustrating the story of the beauty and the beast. Most things are painted uh, dry over dry. Where you do an area, it dries, then you do an area, it dries, you do an area. So what happens is uh, you get crisp lines, but it's not real exciting sometimes. That's a difficult thing to know when to, to work in watercolor. If you if you wait if it's too wet and you work into it, it um, it just turns to mud, I mean mush, it just goes everywhere. If it's too dry, it becomes brittle and you know it it's not it's not exciting, it loses. But if you can catch it just before it dries, you can do a lot more with it. You can it could be you can, do, you can do detail, but it has, still has energy. Illustrator Mark English, an artist with an international reputation of his own, says, you ask anybody in the business, the advertising and publishing world, and they know who John Collier is. Norman Rockwell was probably the only illustrator the public ever recognized, and he had the best forum you could have, the cover of the Saturday Evening Post. English spares few adjectives describing Collier's work. John is an exceptional artist. I think he's one of the best in America in the total picture. His paintings are very identifiable. When someone buys something of John's, they know what they're going to get. Mark English says Collier's style, a sort of post-impressionist realism, and his medium, usually pastels, is part of his look. It gives his work a certain softness and that ethereal or spiritual quality. When he paints someone, they're more interesting in his painting than they are in real life. In the 19th century, drawing and, and all of art was taught as a skill that, that you could acquire if you had persistence and had a little bit of talent. Gradually, as it came into the 30s and 40s with abstract expressionism, it was no longer a skill to be acquired. You really had to look inside yourself because the, uh, the painting was already there. Today, drawing is very important again. St teachers are trying to, to teach drawing again, and students are excited about it. I think it's a good thing for students to copy other artists' work. That was just thought of as being horrible a few years ago. But the painter that you're copying has already has simplified your problem. He's solved the problems of composition and color. He, he solved all those problems. You don't really have to worry about that. When you're copying a great work of art, what you're doing is you're just learning how to get your hand, learning how to mix the colors and how to put them on the canvas um, like they did. After you've learned just to actually just to render the way um, oh, Titian did, if you can do that, then you, uh, while you're doing that, you're learning to think the way Titian thought. Uh, you could next step maybe to to do a painting in Titian style or or Watteau or Degas or anyone. Uh, you learn to think the way Degas did. You have to think the way Degas did in order to do a thing in his style. It doesn't doesn't mean that you can think nearly as well as Degas did, but there has to be something. There has to be some sense of the way he approached the problem in order to do a, a drawing that that's like. Degas or Titian. Um, that approach helped me a lot. When I was starting to be an artist, there was a, I could knock off just about anybody you can, I could think of after a while. I mean, at first I was terrible, but eventually I was able to do something in almost, in almost anyone's style. Um, but something that happens after you've done that a lot is you start getting a sense of what of what style really is. 
and and what and also you get a sense of what style really isn't. Style is um, style is really a point of view. It's the way you look at a problem. It's the way you look at life. Um, it's easy when you're when you haven't gone through this process to think of style as um, well. If I if I want to paint in the style of of Degas, then I just have to manipulate the pastel the way Degas manipulated it, and I can be as good as Degas. But it isn't. It isn't that way. You learn that. Uh, you can never really think like Degas. That you, what you need to do is to be able to to learn more and more of the way you think about the world. In the distant past, there was little distinction made between illustration and fine art. Religious paintings included portraits of the patrons, desirous of showing their piety to the community. Religious art was commissioned. The forms, subject matter, and uses were prescribed. Many early church works were never signed by their unknown creators. Historically, many famous artists have done both commissioned and gallery consigned work. It was early in this century that fine art and illustration became widely separated, and it is toward the end of the 20th century that the distinctions are once again becoming blurred. The apparent freedom that um, that fine artists have, that illustrators look at, and wish they could, wish they could also have, um, may not be quite as as real as they think it is. Um, we're talking about the average illustrator and the average fine artist. The average illustrator uh, gets to draw and paint and is relatively well paid for it. Um, the average, well, let me back up. He works for another artist, an art director, at least someone trained as an artist, who, if he's a good art director, will fight for the work to the client, convince the client that this is this is something he should use. Um, the average fine artist, not not the great fine artist, but the average fine artist, sells in a gallery. Uh, his client is the public who. Is, prob is probably not nearly as educated as the art director in what makes art good. Consequently, the well, also he he has uh, oh he's under pressure from the gallery owner, who who may not be well trained in art either. There are people who own furniture stores and decided that they liked art better, so they started selling art. Uh, they learn what they know about art from the artists that they represent normally. Uh, so this uh, gallery owner will say, "You remember the um, oh, remember that landscape you did with the trees and the flowers? Well, that sold right away. I think you should think about selling some more trees and flowers." And uh, and the artist who is not really getting paid all that well, he may be getting a few hundred dollars for his work, uh, maybe, well, it could be almost any amount, but probably it's not, it's not nearly as much as an illustrator with a similar amount of training. So um, he really has to make the sale. He can't say, it's very, well, he can say, but it's very difficult for him to say, I'm not going to paint the trees and flowers because uh, I'm going to keep my artistic integrity. He has to say, uh, Maybe I should paint at least one more tree and flower painting uh, so that I can make the rent, and then after I make the rent, then I can do the painting I want to do. The Impressionists were rejected. The Impressionists, we now feel were the most important artists of the period, uh, but they were rejected by the public. The Impressionists wanted to be accepted, but they were rejected. Gradually, 
uh, the next group of painters that came along, the post-impressionists and after that the expressionists, the mystique was developed that if you were a great artist, uh, you won't be accepted by the public. It's a strange feeling, but that's what happened. Uh, at the same time, around the turn of the century, illustration and fine arts split. Uh, in the 19th century, illustrators and fine artists were just about the same people. Winslow Homer did both things. But when illustration and fine art split, uh, the, uh, the illustrator, there, there needed to be a group of artists that could do the public's art. Uh, there needed to be artists that were accessible to the public, and that became the illustrators. The fine artists uh, wanted to be rejected by the public, so they went their own way and, and did wonderful pieces. Gradually, illustration, because it had to be accepted by the public um, in, the, say, the 40s and 50s, became awfully wishy-washy and really wasn't very serious art at all, and I don't think even ever pretended to be. But gradually in the 60s, with the mood of the public changing and accepting m more serious things, Illustration and fine art got closer and closer together. In fact, some artists crossed over. Andy Warhol, Richard Linder, James Rosenquist, they, they are now thought of as, as fine artists. But at the time, they were illustrators. James Rosenquist uh, painted billboards. I think the mood is, is set now that illustration and fine art can be even closer together. The public, in general, has a level of taste higher than it did in the past. Illustrators and fine artists realize, I think, that art can be appreciated on many levels. The public may not appreciate art to the extent that an artist would or an art critic would or someone that's educated in the arts, but they can appreciate it on their level. That isn't to say that the art, because it's appreciated by the public, can't be profound. It can be. Consequently, I think the, uh, the, uh, the, the difference between the fine arts and illustration is beginning to blur even more. Uh, while I've said that the, uh, the illustration of the 40s and 50s was, was pretty lightweight, I still have a lot of respect for some of the people that were illustrating. Uh, Norman Rockwell in particular. I once called Norman Rockwell and uh, I was, uh, actually I did it on a dare. I, I got his number from a friend who got it from Good Housekeeping. I called him up. The first time the message was garbled, I called, I had to hang up, and it was half an hour before I got my um, courage up. My, my heart was beating so fast. Finally I called him up again, and, and here I had this incredible artist on the phone, and I couldn't think of anything to say to him. Uh, so I asked him about how he got his work back and forth from New York, and, and that was the end of it. I felt really foolish, but it was, a, it was exciting to talk to Norman Rockwell. What makes artwork good should really be left to art historians. Whether the art is appropriate to the assignment can make artwork good, even if it's not profound. If it's moving, that can make artwork good. Uh, I think that it probably has more to do with the difference between truth and a beautiful lie than it has to do with whether the, artwork, whether the artist has facility with his hands or, or something like that. Probably in explaining this, we, I should say something about what I'm not trying to say. I'm not trying to say that I'm not trying to talk about the difference between realism and abstraction. Realism, a realist painting can be full of deception, and an abstract painting is certainly no guarantee that the artist is given an accurate rendering of his, of his subconscious. I'm not talking about the difference between a serious painting and a lighthearted painting, and I'm, I'm not talking about the difference between beautiful and ugly, Beautiful things can be deceptive, and ugly things are often profound. I'm not talking about the difference between secular or sacred. It could have a little more to do with the difference between boring and exciting. 
boring things are rarely truthful, even though exciting things can either be true or a lie. I'm certainly not talking about the difference between my belief and your belief. It may be better to give an, a, an example. If you look at, or if you were to show someone, a, let's say, Rembrandt's painting of Bathsheba, you say to a person, this is what a woman is like, and the person looks at it, and if he's a thoughtful person, says, yes, that, that is what a woman is like. Uh, contrast that to uh, a centerfold, and you say to the thoughtful person, this is what a woman is like. But the thoughtful person will probably say, no, that's really not what a woman is like. And the reason is because Rembrandt has made a, a complete statement about Bathsheba, about a particular woman. He's told us not just what she looks like, he's said that she's a woman who has a dilemma and she faces problems and he talks about her personality. The centerfold is just a picture of a pretty girl. In the Rembrandt, we are given a complete statement and we're satisfied. And since we're satisfied, we come back and we're, we enjoy looking at it over and over again. In the centerfold, we're only given part of the information. In fact, we're given so little information that it becomes deceptive. It's a lie, but it's a beautiful lie. It's easy to understand the difference between Bathsheba and a centerfold, but many problems are not that easy. In fact, that becomes one of the principal problems for the artist and for anyone to learn the difference between the truth and beautiful lie. I use my two daughters occasionally in my work. I use my cats a lot and my dog once in a while. Um, I, I, I usually use friends as models. It's hard for me to, there has to be a little bit of, it's a funny thing, for models there has to be a little bit of separation, emotional separation between me and the model to do a good job. When I'm very close to the person it's hard for me to use them as a model, I don't know why. Uh, on the other hand it's very hard for me to paint a, do a painting of someone I don't know at all. Some artists think that a um, person's art should take first place over everything, and that was a temptation for me, especially in the beginning. But to put art in first place is really destructive to the art. Art should be a, should be a reflection of, of what you think about things. It's the way you, it's a reflection of what you think is important and the way you see life, and to put it above uh, God or religion or your family or your children uh, would be destructive to the art. People are always loading art down with uh, baggage that it was really never meant to carry. For instance, if a person wants to make a philosophical statement, 
he's really taking a philosophical statement is really a verbal idea, and he's taking that verbal idea and trying to translate it into a visual medium. It, it doesn't work very well. Art is really a poor way to preach. A much better way to make a philosophical statement of, well, I'm a Christian, and if you're a Christian like I am, it affects you emotionally. And because it affects you emotionally, uh, it comes out in your painting. You, you can't help yourself. And I think that's, if you're trying to make a philosophical statement, that's a much better way to do it. When it comes out spontaneously and naturally, it affects people. Uh, it's accessible to people. They, they feel it and they can't help themselves. What one's worldview is matters. Creative talent can be seen as God-given or as only something resident in one's self. How one sees the source of creativity determines how one develops and uses talent. When we look at the body of work of any artist, we have a window into his soul. We can see his values and beliefs about life. A superficial person can't help but produce superficial art, no matter how gifted he is. What one believes is always reflected in one's creative work. The fundamental question then for the artist, as well as anyone else, is not, how do I express myself, but rather, 
What do I believe that has meaning? Are the things I believe about life true?